For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Jay. I'm the outreach pastor here. And, uh, you know, my family and I, we've only been here for about a year and a half or so. Um, it, but it, just being here is just a, a testimony of just God's grace as he led us. Uh, the desire to be a part of a diverse church community that was actively seeking to engage the community um, has been on my heart for many, many years. And uh, after serving at uh, my previous church for about 23 years, God opened up a door to, to come and be here. And so I'm so excited, so thankful for all the many people that uh, I get to serve with, but also the many people that I've uh, met here. So uh, praise God. And uh, I'm also so thankful for our brother, Jack Dombrowski, who gave us a powerful message last Sunday uh, from 2 Corinthians 12. Man, I've had to cling on to verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12 all week for it says, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That gave me hope, um, and continues to give me hope every day. That in spite of all of my imperfections, my weaknesses, and failures, God's grace is sufficient. Uh, and, and it's sufficient to keep doing extraordinary things through an ordinary guy like me. So I'm so thankful, and it's uh, truly a privilege to be here. It's, you know, every day, it's only by God's grace that we get to live another day, and to be here with God's people, and to be here with, uh, be here as part of God's family through Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is. So uh, th today, I get to uh, bring a message from God's Word to all of you, and uh, as you have heard, uh, those of us who have been filling the pulpit this summer were asked to preach on our life verse in a series called Live by Every Word. And my life verse, at least like Zach, the, the first of many is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I'm sure that's a very uh, familiar uh, passage to many of you. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And that verse was introduced to me by my brother, Jack. He's two years older than me. We had been going to church all our lives. My mom would take me, my brother, my sister to church with her all the time. So church was a part of my life growing up. But unfortunately, God wasn't because I never took God seriously growing up. Even though I had heard all the Bible stories and the message of Jesus countless times growing up in church, it wasn't until I was 19 years old, the summer after my freshman year in college, that God broke through. He broke through my pride, my self-righteousness, and gave me an opportunity to hear the message clearly. And I responded in faith to the message of the gospel started my journey with the Lord. And so as a new believer, my brother gave me my first real Bible. Now, of course, they're all real, but for me, this was the first one I wanted to read, okay? And so it was a, a really nice, thick NIV study Bible. I think I gained some muscles from carrying that thing around. Um, but uh, inside that front cover, my brother wrote out this verse of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And he told me that this was his life verse. He shared with me why it was so important to him. And the more I studied it, the more I meditated on it, that <clears throat> clearly became my life verse as well. And so the exhortation to trust in the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Like, that's not just my life verse. That's the goal of my life. And I hope hopefully yours too every day. See, God is bringing this word to us at a time where I think we need it more than ever to trust him. You know, this past year and a half, it's been filled with so many changes and, and challenges and conflicts and stress and loss and pain and suffering. The list can go on and on. Many have gone through quite the wave of destruction and devastation, at least disruption, and some are still trying to get back to what they once knew. But here's one thing I, wanna, I want you to hear. For many of you, things may not get back to what you once knew. And I know you may not want to hear that today. But listen, many have suffered 
from illnesses and, and injuries, loss of jobs, loss of financial security, loss of friendships, broken relationships, and loss of loved ones. Life cannot be the same after those things. But one thing we have to know is that just because something is different doesn't mean that it's worse. Because God can use those situations and circumstances for his glory and his purposes. We don't have to lose hope. Because no matter how much the world around us has changed, and no matter how much our life circumstances have changed, our God in heaven has not changed. He is still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he's still in control. Amen? Amen. And it all may not make sense to us, but that's okay. But we have to remember what God says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, God knows so much more than we could possibly understand, and his ways are so much greater than ours because our God is good and perfect and faithful. You know, some of you have had some type of relationship with God for, for quite some time now. And it's, it's beautiful to see. Others may just be getting started or are still trying to learn what this is all about. But regardless of where you are, I believe God has a word for you today. A word of encouragement, a word of truth that can help you to put your trust in the Lord and help you experience a life full of greater hope and peace and purpose. So let's go to God in prayer and ask for this and believe for this by faith. Father, we are so thankful, Lord God, that in the midst of life's chaos and confusion and, and all different circumstances, Lord God, that can really throw us off track, we're thankful, Lord God, that we have the, the assurance, the hope, the peace that you have not changed, and that you are still with us. So God, we thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your faithfulness. And Lord, today as we dig into your word, may you open up our eyes and, and our ears and allow your truth to, to speak to us, but also to change us, that, we, that our lives may be different because of the power of your word in our hearts. We praise you, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles here, would you turn um, to the book of Proverbs chapter 3 with me? Proverbs chapter 3, and, and as you do, I want to give you just a little bit of a background quickly. The book of Proverbs is a book of wise sayings, and it's part of the, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament part of the Bible, along with Job and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, or otherwise known as Song of Songs. And most of Proverbs is written by King Solomon, son of King David who was known to be one of the wisest men by the grace of God. And he writes these in order to pass on and impart godly wisdom, especially to the next generation, including us, to teach us to know God and think like him and how to live out our faith through wise decisions because of our relationship with God. And in the very beginning in chapter 1, Verse 7, he gives us the theme of this entire book of Proverbs. It's this pivotal verse that lays the foundation. And he says, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That fear of the Lord in Proverbs 1.7, it's not like something uh, that you, you might be afraid of and you're like cowering and, and running away from, trying to get away from this thing that you're afraid of. It's the opposite. This, this fear of the Lord is, is where you are so in awe, so amazed at his goodness and, and have such a pure reverence and you hold God to the highest esteem that you want to run towards him and, and be with him and know him better just like a little child might do to his or her father. So as we understand this, our first point of this message is that trust, 
grow stronger as I know God and obey him. My trust grows stronger as I know God and obey him. Let's take a look at those first four verses of Proverbs 3. Solomon says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your hearts keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Solomon writes, uh, knowing, that, um, f- knowing full well that his wisdom comes from God, and he's writing this to his son. And listen, if you have a son, or I mean, if you have a child as a, as a Christian parent, it's your duty, and more than that, it's your privilege to not only care for your child, but to, and to protect them and to love them, but to raise them up in the way of the Lord so that they will come to know God and love Him and honor Him. And dads, dads, uh, I just want to speak to you for a second. Dads, I love you, dads. I just want to be real with you for a second. You see, God gave you and gave us a special calling. First and foremost, to be an amazing husband to your wife, to love her as Christ loved the church. Amen? Amen? And that's a special love. It's an unconditional love as Christ loved the church. And when our children can see that, that gives them a great example of what God's love is all about. But as a father, not only to change dirty diapers and, and feed your baby and, 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 and child and, and have lots of fun with them, you've been called, dads, as a spiritual head of the family to impart wisdom to them, to guide them down the narrow path, a path that can be straight and clear as you teach them and help them to engage with God and his word. So I pray for you men and you dads especially that you will take this message to heart as you see this loving father wanting his son to experience life with God to the fullest, okay? And even if you're not a parent or don't have young children around you, God still wants you to impart godly wisdom and help train up a younger or newer believer in the faith. Just like the Apostle Paul, he didn't have any children of his own, but he treated Young men like Timothy as his spiritual son, he nurtured him and he trained him and uh, helped him to become a powerful witness for the Lord. And that's what we call discipleship. And that's what we're, here, what we're about here at CityLine. We're a church that loves God, loves people, makes disciples for the glory of God. That's our mission here at church, at CityLine Bible Church. And, you know, when you become a member here, you agree that that's what you're going to commit to also. Now, most of you may be more familiar with the concept of loving God and loving people and maybe even seeking the glory of God. But that part about making disciples, for some that's just kind of a foreign thing or just something that's confusing, not really sure how to do it, what to do, and that's okay. But just remember, Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28. And I don't believe that Jesus would give us a command that we were incapable of doing. By the grace of God, with him all things are possible. So when God calls you to do something, listen to this, when God calls you to do something, trust him Trust that he will equip you and provide all that you need to fulfill his calling. Amen? And so in order for us to be effective as as disciple makers, we need to keep growing in our faith ourselves as, as a disciple. We need to stay fully dependent on the Lord, trusting in him to sanctify us, to to make us more like Jesus, and keep trusting in him with every part of our lives. And so the question is, how does trust in the Lord develop? Well, think about how you learn to trust another person, okay? Maybe there's some singles in this room. Maybe you've been through some situations where you're trying to find out if this person is uh, a trustworthy person, uh, someone that's 
maybe good for you. Um, and so what do you do? How do you learn? Well, you might hear about what others have to say about this person. You might see who they are and, and what they're like, especially in different contexts and around different people. You might spend time with them, trying to get to know them, trying to talk with them and, and to see, are they genuine? Are they consistent? Do they have a, uh, a genuine interest in you and, and your well-being and, and those around them or her? And if you're, you're seeking a professional, let's say, a doctor, a dentist, a mechanic, you know, you might want to know how good they are at what they do. Are they knowledgeable? Are they successful? Are they reliable? And do they have a good character? Are they demonstrating integrity and honesty and fairness? You see, you're not going to trust someone you don't know. So if you're here struggling with trusting in God, maybe, just maybe, that's an indication that you don't know him well enough yet. And that's why we're here. You see, when it comes to trusting the Lord, the awesome truth is that God wants us to know him. He wants us to explore his word, and he wants our trust to grow stronger and stronger as we know him and obey him. He wants us to spend time with him to try to understand who he is and is he really trustworthy. So that's why God gave us his word, which the Bible says is living and active, to help us know him, to direct us, to live according to his his standard of what is right and good. And that's the difference. You see, many people will spend time in their lives reading certain parts of this book called the Bible. And they'll, they'll share how they've read different things, but things just aren't changing. And what we are called to do is not just to read what's here, but to, to really read it to know and understand the Lord more fully by living with this commitment to obey what we read. We're not called just to seek, uh, to gain information from the Bible. We're here to encounter the living God through his words and then to seek to, to live out his words in obedience as our demonstration of faith and love to the Lord. So friends, are you seeking the Lord daily through the truth that he gave us in his Bible? We need to make God and his word our highest priority, that we might know him and know what he desires, know what he expects of us so that we can keep growing in wisdom and understanding. You know, we need to continue to put ourselves in environments where we have the opportunity to hear God's word being preached and taught like you are right now, but also through all the many other opportunities around us like media, things like Moody Radio on our radio stations, or or online resources like Right Now Media, which some of you are familiar with and some of the community groups are using with their studies. You can go, if you're not familiar, you can go right on our website, right under our teaching tab, and and click that Right Now Media uh, link to get free access to thousands of teaching videos. It's amazing. We need to continue to have and make time to consistently read and study God's word on our own as well as with others in our community group. God wants us to know all about him, and you will see that God is a God who is in control. He's got this. No matter what we're going through, he's got this. He's with us, and he wants us to trust him to keep working in and through us for his glory. So as you grow As you grow in knowledge and and wisdom, Solomon writes, he says in verse 3, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Listen, he doesn't want us to just grow big in our heads of just knowledge and information and just be useless just doing our own thing. He wants that knowledge and that wisdom to transform us so that we are becoming more and more like God here. Steadfast love and faithfulness can only describe God. That is an incredible love that is, that is loyal and full. And it describes who God is and how he loves us unconditionally. 
And one thing you see here in chapter 3, especially in the first uh, 12 verses, is that every time Solomon gives us this command or exhortation in the odd verses, these even verses, he reveals a promise, a reward, something that we get to experience as we trust God and, and obey him. So what we see here in, in verse 2 is that for a length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. This peace is prosperity. It's, it's, it's the word shalom, which, of course, is the sense of peace, but there's so much more than what we understand peace to be. It's, it does include prosperity. It does include this wholeness, this, this health, this harmony that is so full and rich that comes when we know and, and have a relationship with the living God. And it reminds me of what Jesus tells us in John 10.10. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I mean, this is a a full life. This is a life full of meaning and purpose. It's it's the way that we were created to live. It's not about quantity. It's about quality. It's not about even the amount of things that you have. Fame, money, power, pleasure. It's about a relationship with the one who has you. And that's good news. He knows you better than anyone will ever know you. And he wants you to know him and walk with him. By digging into his word and obeying what he gives us here. And secondly, trust. Trust is genuinely, trust is genuine when I rely on God. And submit to him. Trust is genuine when I rely on God and submit to him. We get to my life verse here in verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Trust, as we know, is is often thought of as belief and faith and confidence. So to trust means to put your confidence in or rely on something or someone or putting yourself wholly at the mercy of another. And that's what leaning, this word leaning too, is all about. It's not just reclining against something, but relying on it totally for support. If you really think about it, we all trust in things or people to some degree every day. It's something that everyone knows how to do, whether they are believers or not, okay? Take, for instance, the chair you're sitting on. Not many of you came here and examined your chair and pushed on it and and just try to explore how solid of a chair it is that that they're sitting on. It's a chair. Its purpose is to hold you and support you when you put your bottom on it, right? And then there it is. We don't think about it. We just trust that this is a chair and this is what it's going to do. It's going to support me. Same as a car. We, we go out to our car. We just, we trust that it's, a, it's made to start and then to run and to get us to where we want to go. Just like our, the gas in our homes or the electric power that we see, we turn on a light switch. We just trust that the power is still on and now I can experience it. It's, it's a common thing for us to trust but we have to think about what, is, what are we really trusting most in? Some are really focused on trusting in the status that they have based on maybe their education, maybe their career, maybe the amount of money that they have or the relationships they have or the fame or, or reputation. Others might be trusting in their own abilities, their own strength, their own wisdom. And that's what Solomon is telling us not to do. Not to lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him. I love what Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller writes. He said, we need to remember to rely not only on the word of the Lord, but also on the Lord of the word. 
I think about that for a second. You know, a lot of times we just focus right here. What does it say? What are these words saying? And we're focusing on the word of the Lord. That's great. But have we missed the Lord of the word in that process? Are you trusting in the Lord with all your heart, fully dependent on him for all things? As you read the word of God, you will, you will get a greater glimpse of who God is. And if God is truly God, then he is trustworthy because he's God Almighty. Think about it. What does the Bible say? It, he's the creator and the sustainer of all things. It also tells us that God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. He's omnipotent. He, he's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. This is a God that knows us and wants us to know him. Trust with all your heart in all your ways. Acknowledge him. Some of us might trust God when life is easy and going well, when we can live within our comfort and convenience. But he says, with all your heart and all your ways, acknowledge him. That word there, acknowledge, means to be aware of. To have this fellowship with and to submit to this God. That's not easy to do unless you truly know your God personally. And when you look in a passage like Colossians 1 and you start to acknowledge that Jesus, Jesus is preeminent. He's supreme that in him all things hold together, you start to realize that this world isn't really all about me. It's about Jesus. And this promise that he will make our path straight means that God will make the course of your life truly successful in his eyes, maybe not in the eyes of the world. It contrasts what we see in chapter 2, verse 12 through 15, that describes a person that is following the way of evil with perverted speech and uh, forsaking the path of unrighteous, walking the ways of darkness, rejoicing in doing evil. It says that their path is crooked. But God says, I have a straight path for you when you trust in me and acknowledge me. This straight path may not guarantee that uh, we will never make mistakes or that life will be easier when we trust in the Lord. You see, I learned how to really start trusting in God when, when life got really hard for me a year after I gave my life to the Lord. My father was not a believer, and I didn't have a close relationship with him growing up. He was there physically, but not emotionally, not even relationally, really. Everything that I did in my life, uh, I did kind of without him present. Any sports that I did, my high school graduation, my, you know, anything, he was not there. But the one thing he always just held firm to was his his. his value of life, or, or at least his standard and his expectation for us, kind of like a lot of Asian parents that you may have heard of. High academic achievement. For him, that was the end all. Well, long story short, after my sophomore year in college, after not living up to his standards, and this was after his disappointment with my sister and my brother and we were all cut off from any financial assistance, which included living in the house. So we were asked to leave. Kicked out of our house, homeless at 20. Thankfully, a friend let me stay with him in his apartment. But that changed my world. I had to drop out of college. I had to figure out what to do. What? Find a job, I guess. That wasn't enough. Find another job. At one point, I had three jobs working 20 hours a day at some days. I was just trying to just survive. I was lost, though, full of disappointment, full of anger, full of bitterness. But it was in that time where God met me. 
I had no one else that I thought I could turn to, no one else I thought I could rely on to keep me going, to help me survive. But all I could do, at the, when you're at the bottom of a barrel, I felt like all I could do was to look up and I could see God. He was the one that I started to turn to. He was the one that I started to depend on. And he was the one that continued to prove faithful time and time again. He revealed himself to me. He revealed just how good he, he is and, and how much he loved me, no matter what was going on in my life. And that's when my faith and trust in him started to grow. But it wasn't easy. I went five years without any relationship or even conversations with my earthly father. But it was at that time in my life that my relationship with my heavenly father became real. God proved himself to me through his presence, through his protection, through his provision, and through his power that transformed me into a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And I praise God for his goodness and his faithfulness. But it gets better. After five years of a broken relationship with my father, God gave me this conviction to humble myself through the help of a, a pastor that was helping me and my now wife to go through premarital counseling and prepare for our marriage. We were not expecting my father to be involved at all, but this pastor challenged me to, to humble myself, to go to my father to repent, to apologize, to, and just leave the results to God. It was the last thing I ever wanted to do. But God gave me the, the courage and the humility to do it. And I went and I did that and I, I let him know that I was getting married, that I, was, God, that I felt like God was calling me into ministry and, and, and that was about it. But in God's amazing timing and his, just in his amazing way, my dad started to come around and, and this relationship started to grow a little bit by a little bit. And so one day, you know, a couple of years after our, our wedding, um, we, we were the closest we had ever been and all by the grace of God. And years kept going, years kept going. My dad started to finally uh, kind of get connected with the church. And long story short, a few years before his, his life uh, ended here on earth due to cancer, I found out that uh, he accepted Christ and had a relationship with the Lord. And you see, it's, you know, I look back on those, those years of my life, and I, as horrible as they were for me, I can give thanks now because I know that God was there and God was working. And it reminds me all the time of Romans 8, 28, where Paul says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is that good. He's working all things out for the good of those who love him. No matter what trials and difficulties we may face, we can still put our hope in the Lord and just, and just see what he will do when we rely on him completely. I think this is the third point here, that trust shows gratitude as I devote my life to God and honor him. Trust shows gratitude as I devote my life to God and honor him. We read in verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who, whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. When we understand who God is and all that he's done, we can honor God with, with gratitude overflowing. He says to honor the Lord with our wealth and the first fruits, that's what tithing is all about. It's not waiting till the end of the month when all the money's gone and saying, sorry, God, uh, I don't have much left to give to you. 
Instead, it's recognizing that this is all because of God's grace, that everything that I have is from God. And so setting apart that at least 10% or whatever it might be that God places in your heart from the beginning of that paycheck and then allocating the rest towards savings and expenses and, and trusting that God's going to provide. This is what it's all about, to, to be thankful, to understand that this is God who is in control and by his grace and mercy, he has allowed us to experience all that we have and he's given us the privilege to be stewards and managers of all that he's given us so that we can honor him with it all. Trusting the Lord with all your heart it means trusting him with every part of your life. Some may say that God, yeah, God, God's Lord of my family. He's Lord of my, my life, my, my health, my hobbies, but not my money. Come on now, my money, that's, that's what I earned, right? But you've heard some preachers preach it. Either God is Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. Either God is Lord of all of our life, or he is not Lord at all. Let's be real with him. Do we truly want him to be in control? Are we willing to recognize him, acknowledge him, and give him the glory and the honor that he deserves? It begins with gratitude. It begins with that heart of gratitude, seeing God for who he is and what he's done, and recognizing that everything that you have is a gift from God. Listen, many of you here have trusted in Christ to forgive you of your sins to reconcile you with your heavenly Father, to give you a new life, a new purpose, a new destiny. So why is it so hard to trust him to sustain you and to keep providing for you just as he says he will do? He says, honor the Lord with all that you have. Honor the Lord. Let him know that it belongs to him. It's his. It's not ours. And he also says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. You see, the, the discipline that we see, it's hard. It's not easy at all to endure. But in Hebrews 12, 7 through 11, we, we read parts of that where it says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But he disciplines us for our good, listen to this, so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Listen, far too many of us, our, our main pursuit in life is to be happy and to, to try to make those around us happy. But God is concerned with something far greater. God is more concerned about your holiness than he is about your happiness. And that's why, as a loving father, he will guide us through times of discipline and, and struggles and challenges so that he can refine us, so that we can become more holy as he is holy. And he's calling us to just trust in him now, to trust that he has a, the right way, he has the big plan and the purpose for us. No matter how crazy it may seem. We, we see examples of that all, all over the Bible. The story of Abraham, where God calls him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Oh, my goodness. Like, how do you do that? But we see Abraham, without any reservations, any hesitations, going right ahead in obedience because he knows who God is. He has a relationship with God. He trusts in who God is, and he trusts that if God is going to do this, and he's going to make another way, and he's going to fulfill his covenant promise that he made to me, because that's who God is. He is faithful, and he is good. You see stories of Joseph, 
Joseph being sold off by his brothers as a, to be, become a slave in a foreign land, thrown in prison. Just, I mean, how much worse can it get? Yet all along, Joseph doesn't quit. He doesn't stop trusting in God. He doesn't stop honoring God and worshiping him. He knows that God has a better way. And sure enough, God shows him what that way is. If things in your life have made you feel like you don't have control, be encouraged to know that God is still in control. The question for all of us is, will we trust him no matter what we face? Will we stay stuck by focusing on our circumstances or will you experience true freedom by focusing on the God who is over all and in control of all your circumstances? I want to I encourage you today that our God has never left you alone. He knows what you've gone through and, and what you're going through, and he's not done yet. He wants you to know that he is not done yet. As we read in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is what God is all about, and this is what he's doing in our lives today. Listen, I want to end with this one last story here. It's a story that was written, documented back in 1898 about an uh, international chess master, Paul Morphy, where he and a friend entered a, uh, an art gallery in Europe. And um, being this international chess master, he was drawn to this one portrait called Checkmate by Moritz Reitz. And in this painting, there's a man playing chess with the devil. And the stake is this young man's soul. And the artist graphically depicts the point in this game where it's apparent, it's a young man's move, and he's just realized he lost the game. The agony of despair being shown in every line of his features and his attitude, while the devil on the opposite side of the table gloating with his fiendish little delightful grin. The game appears utterly hopeless for this young man. His soul was lost. Paul Murphy staring at this, this portrait, and he just, he's just locked in, and he just can't move. His friend has moved on to other, other paintings, and he's locked in, and finally he says, hold on, hold on, somebody bring me a chessboard. I need to figure this out. And he puts the pieces exactly as he sees in this painting. He looks at it, and he shouts out, it's not over. It's not over. The young man has one more move, a move that can win. Mr. Morphy, this international chess master, showed exactly how this young man could not only escape his situation, but win the match. You know, listen, every day we are in a battle for our souls. The, the devil is, you know, he's working hard. He makes a move. We make a move. We go back and forth. Sometimes it seems like we're winning, and sometimes it seems like we're not. But once in a while, we feel like we may be backed into a corner, ready to give up. Life is hard. There's just so much going on that we just, that we're, I just don't feel like we're in control anymore. But when those times come, we need to remember something that we always have one more move because we have a master who sees that move. He's the one that is in control, right? He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our situation better than we can see. He knows who we are. He knows how we feel, what we're capable of. He knows our strengths, our weaknesses. And when we turn it over to him and let him show us how to win, we will always be victorious. Even in our darkest hour where there seems to be no hope in sight, our master can come and show us a path to victory. There is always one more move for us because of Jesus Christ. So I want to just end with this last verse here from Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him 
be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is a God who is in control. He's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And this is a God who is inviting you to turn to him right now and trust him. Put your faith and your trust in him. Let's pray together, family. Listen, I know there is so much going on in your lives and in the lives of those around you. And we know that it's been hard and, and unimaginably confusing and difficult. Many are confused and many are just kind of coasting and wandering and kind of just trying to figure, find their way as if they're in a dark room. But today, today God has given us a reason to, put, to have hope, a reason to move forward with a greater confidence because he is here with us. The living God who is sovereign over all creation, the creator and sustainer of all things, is the one who knows us and loves us, who's the one who is over all and sovereign over every situation and circumstance we may find ourselves. So friends, I want to give you an opportunity today to just proclaim your trust in him <laughs> far more than your trust in anything else around you. Today, I just want to invite you to stand where you are with everyone's eyes closed. Just stand where you are. If you want to let God know today that, God, I am turning my heart over to you. I am committed to trusting in you more fully today and tomorrow by your grace and your love and your mercy. I want to trust you with my life, with my circumstances. I want to trust you to be the one that's in control. If that's where your heart is, would you just stand right now? We just want to pray for you. Stand wherever you are and just let the Lord know, God, this is where my heart is. I just want to trust you, Lord. I just want to surrender the control of my life to you. You are the only one. You are the only one worthy to be in control. God, we praise you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Think about who is in control of your life right now and who it is and or what it is that you are trusting. If it's not the Lord, let him know today that, that you desire a change, a change in your path, a change in your trajectory, that you desire to be in a path that is leading towards him, to know him, to love him, to honor him, to glorify him. So if that's you, just stand where you are. I just want to pray for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, we praise you, Lord God, for who you are. We're all here, Lord God, just weak vessels, Lord God, so limited, so imperfect, and so broken in many ways. But God, we turn to you and trust you, Lord God, that you are a God that is living and active, just like your word. You are alive, Lord God, and you are in control. You are here with us, Lord God. And for that, we can rejoice. That we can have a greater confidence, Lord God, with all the things going on in our lives, knowing that you are here and in control. So God, I pray a special blessing upon all these brothers and sisters standing here in this room. May you watch over them, Lord God. May you come and fill them, Lord God, with a greater peace, with greater comfort, Lord God, a greater reassurance, Lord God, that no matter what they are going through right now, Lord God, that you are there and they can experience, Lord God, peace with you, joy with you, Lord God. And they can be assured, Lord God, that you are working in that situation for their good and for your glory. So bless them, Lord God. Encourage them, Lord God, and the rest of us in this room as well. May we have, Lord God, a fresh new desire and conviction to put our trust in you, for you are good. We praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray.